guys hear me okay? Seems like it. Thank, thank you, Andrew. That was very nice of you to say, and I'm honored if I've really kind of jazzed you up for amphibians. Um, I certainly get excited about them, um, and I wanted to talk with you guys today about a specific type of amphibian salamanders and um, how they helped me to discover my why. Uh, and these are a lot of great talks today. I've really appreciated it. And I really, every single one of them have tied in to what I'd like to talk about. And most recently with BC and thinking about how grateful I am that I've discovered this thing that drives me. And it really started with meeting the right mentor at the right time uh, in my life. And that was uh, undergrad. Jewish uh, professor who taught herpetology, and I'll get to that soon. But I just wanted to say that I've really appreciated the time here so far, and I hope that I can contribute and get you guys excited about these. We've been talking about some big issues today, and the, what I want to talk about is like that that big, is little salamanders. But uh, hopefully, you'll enjoy them too. Uh, that is a clutch of spotted salamander eggs developing in the embryos right there. But what I wanted to really start with is getting you guys to kind of imagine uh, this scene that had a profound effect on me, and I'm going to try my best to share it with you guys. Um, my herpetological career, at least in research, started in the woods in Massachusetts in the winter. Uh, and it's very cold in Massachusetts in the winter. Uh, I don't know if you have ever been there, but it's not like here at all. It goes below freezing and just stays there for a month. Uh, and at the end, you know, around March, right when it's going to start to warm up, um, we, get, we get excited. Our, our herpetologists get excited. We go out into the woods on what's probably going to be the first rainy night of the year right when it comes just above freezing, so maybe 38 degrees, and, uh, and it's raining, and you're out there at the edge of a pond, and you're freezing cold, and you see this little salamander climbing on the snow, trying to get to this breeding pond. So I'm shivering. I've got a coat on, a rain jacket, and I can produce my own body heat, and this little guy is ectothermic, he cannot produce his own metabolic body heat, but he's trucking across the snow to get to the breeding pond. The determination of these guys really struck me, you know, and that's amazing, but I had heard that that first rainy night of the year in Massachusetts was called big night, you know, big night, because that's when the animals migrate to their breeding ponds. But sure enough, the rains got a little harder, and a little while later, there was my first migration of spotted salamanders, and that's an amazing sight. These animals are amazing to me, <laughs> and they are invisible 51 weeks of the year. You know, they're underneath things. You don't see them. They're there. They're here in Metro Atlanta. This species is in Metro Atlanta, but you don't see them because they're underneath things. They stay out of the way. You know, reptiles and amphibians like to remain hidden but that first rainy night of the year, if you are ever lucky enough to witness a spotted salamander migration, it's an amazing thing. Uh, they're looking for little parts of the pond where they have thawed so they can slip in under the ice and breed, you know, and that's what they're going for. And um, this is a typical puddle after it's begun to thaw. And uh, I called it a puddle. Uh, scientifically, they're known as ephemeral wetlands or seasonal pools, uh, temporary pools. That, to me, is a puddle. And those are the types of wetlands I've uh, spent the last 15 or so years studying. And, uh, and this is the kind of wetland that really gets me excited. And it's the type of, of these puddles are what spotted salamanders need to breed in. Uh, when I was doing this, my first research project, I got to see them laying eggs. I got to watch the eggs hatch. I got to watch the larva develop. And it all has to happen under a severe time crunch because that pond is going to dry up. And it's going to dry up in a few months. So they really have to get in and get out because every year that pond, that little puddle, dries up. And that's another thing that I found seriously fascinating about that. Um, so my first time uh, 
studying this cycle with spotted salamanders uh, really introduced me to this remarkable species here. And look how cute they are. I mean, <laughs> look at that. Um, so that really, really got my heart. I immediately fell in love with these little guys and I was seeing them by the hundreds, the parents coming in, the little babies coming out. Um, and it was concurrent with my last semesters as an undergraduate at the University of Massachusetts. So I was there, I was actually a sociology major, kind of a little bit inspired, uh, and I took the herpetology class as an elective just because I had a passing interest in frogs. And it, that Dr. Alan Richmond and his herpetology class changed my life. It really is divided before I took that class and after I took that class. And I haven't looked back since. I've been full on amphibian biology since then. And I've had no regrets. Uh, not a lot of money. There's not a lot of money in that. But the, that video we just watched, you know, it's inspired by, by making a difference, you know, and learning about these amazing creatures. That class taught me so many things that were so valuable. And I just soaked it all up. It was all information I wanted. And I just couldn't believe how amazing these animals were. And the deeper I got into them, the more I became fascinated. Uh, one of the things I learned was that amphibians are everywhere. You know, I was just trying to convey that to you. But there are amphibians on every continent except Antarctica. And they live in places you would never think an amphibian would live, uh, the desert, in the Arctic Circle. Um, these are were crazy things that I had learned. And uh, they also, that how many amphibians there are. Uh, if you weighed all the salamanders in Atlanta on one side and all the mammals and birds of all species on the other, the salamanders would outweigh it. There are lots of them here. We just don't see them. And that's one of the main points I'm trying to convey is that they're here. Uh, and that is what an amphibian biomass might look like. That's a migration of tiger salamanders. And just look at that. It's crazy. <laughs> they are driven beasts. Um, I also learned that amphibians are vital. You know, you guys think about frogs, and the frogs eat flies. And they do indeed love to eat flies. But they, you know, most amphibians eat insects. Spotted salamanders, like the ones I showed you at first, specialize in mosquitoes. They eat mosquitoes. That's one thing I'm trying to drive to you guys, how much of an impact amphibians have on our lives. Because a 1,000 spotted salamanders can eat 5 million mosquitoes in a year. That's a lot of mosquitoes. So you can think about the job that they're doing for us by eating all of those mosquitoes every year. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, not only do they eat, well, frogs will basically eat anything they can fit in their mouths, as you can see here. But they are also right in the middle of the food chain. So they're very important to all different types of animals, a uh, whole host of predators of any kind, birds, mammals, uh, reptiles, even other frogs love to eat frogs. And if they don't eat the frogs, then they eat the tadpoles. And if they don't eat the tadpoles, then they eat the eggs. They're just apparently very delicious at all life stages. <laughs> this, picture, this picture here was taken at the botanical garden. Uh, one of the visitors took that. It's a heron eating a, a, one of the bullfrogs in one of the fountains. That's an incredible picture. It's very graphic, but it's, a, it's an incredible <laughs> picture. Uh, um, amphibians are also vital in another key way. They are very sensitive to the environment. You'll never see a frog drink. They absorb all their liquids through their skin. Uh, a lot of amphibians also respire through their skin as well. Uh, so basically anything that's in the environment is absorbed through an amphibian's skin. Uh, and so they are therefore very sensitive to what is happening in the environment. And often, the first group of animals to respond to imbalances in the environment. Uh, and we need to pay attention to what their responses are telling us, because they're responding. They've been responding for quite a while now. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, amphibians are also extremely useful to human health. Uh, this little frog here is an endangered species, but it's also a poison frog from Ecuador, the phantasmal poison frog. 
We have these free ranging at the Atlanta Botanical Garden if you've never been there. There are thousands of these frogs loose in the conservatory. Uh, the compounds in this, in this frog's skin, epipitidine, is uh, 200 times more potent than morphine at relieving pain. And we heard about the dangers of morphine earlier. The compounds in this frog's skin are non-addictive and even more powerful than morphine. So you can see the pharmaceutical value of some of these species. Other frog species are investigated for uh, treatment of HIV and cancer. And the list goes on and on for the pharmaceutical treasure chest that exists in the, in the amphibian world. Uh, the gastric brooding frog, or the platypus frog, is already extinct. This is an amazing species that was first described in the 80s. The male shuts down his digestive system and eats the eggs. And then when the frogs are finished developing, they just climb right up out of daddy. <laughs> Look at that. That's insane. And that is really interesting. But that frog is extinct. It does not exist anymore. And that's the same with this beautiful golden toad. If you wanted to go out in the wild and find one of these toads, it would be impossible. Uh, at the Botanical Garden, um, we have, been, have an amphibian conservation, conservation program that started in the mid-90s. And it started uh, to use, actually using the garden and its beautiful indoor ecosystems to uh, preserve and create captive assurance colonies of rare and endangered amphibian species. And I'm having a little slideshow here of some of the really amazing species we've been working with since then. Um, beautiful frogs that are no longer safe in the wild. Uh, most of the projects have been from Costa Rica, Panama, and Ecuador, and the southeast US. But you can see these are some really amazing species. Um, but my job there, which I love, has brought me back around. And now we're starting a project with this flatwood salamander, which is closely related to those spotted salamanders. But this one is probably the most or one of the most endangered amphibians in this country. And uh, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about this project that we're starting now. The flatwood salamander is beautiful. Look at it. <laughs> and, uh, it used, to occur, um, it used to occur in South Carolina through Florida, uh, Georgia, then Florida, and Alabama. Uh, and this is prior to 97 when one of the biggest research papers were done on it. And then I want you guys to see their current range. So there it is. So it's gone from here to here. And each one of those dots is literally just a little puddle or a couple of closely connected puddles. Uh, about the size of the one I showed you earlier. They are not doing well. Um, and because of that, the federal government came to us a couple years ago and asked us to try to build a captive assurance colony for flatwood salamanders. So last year, we went out and we looked um, here and throughout these puddles here. And I, it wasn't just me. I had a team of experts working with these salamanders to go out and try to find them, and we couldn't. We were unable to find a single larva. Um, so over the summer, a task force met um, to discuss what to do about this species. So we collectively pooled our information, and we collectively believed that uh, flatwood salamanders had three to five years left uh, before they went extinct without some type of intervention. You know, uh, t the time to do like in the field type of conservation measures was over, and we needed to collect any that we could find to uh, bring into a captive assurance colony and try to breed them in captivity. So that's what we decided to do this year. Uh, right now, we're about to start, uh, next week, we're doing our first samplings in South Georgia, looking for the larvae so that we can uh, bring them in, raise them up to healthy reproductive adults, which has never been done before and breed them in captivity, which has never been done before, and then hopefully produce salamanders to release back in the wild in protected, restored habitat, which has also never been done. So it's a very terrifying project with huge consequences, but it's also very exciting and an opportunity to give back to these 
animals that have meant so much to me. And again, look how cute it is. It's just so cute. <laughs> and they want to make sure that they can persist, you know. And um, so uh, I have a couple of, also a couple of leads here. If you're interested in amphibian conservation, uh, one of the things I was, uh, as far as how you can help, just now that you know, you know that amphibians are everywhere. You know, they're at our feet and they're in our urban neighborhoods too. If you think that's cool, you know, tell your friends because like, there's a good chance that they don't know what's going on here with these amphibians. And I'm meeting people all the time that are still even unaware that amphibians are in decline. Uh, we offer frog call workshops at the Atlanta Botanical Garden and we train people how to identify frogs by call. So you can do amphibian surveys here in Metro Atlanta. We have 40 sites here inside the perimeter right now, and we're always looking to train citizen scientists to build an army to go protect our urban amphibians. Um, we have a, a blog. I have the link on, on the end here. So you can, if you're interested, sub subscribe to our blog. If you see something you like, po post it on your own social networks and help us get the word out there. Um, and I also have a link here about how to turn your backyard and into an amphibian-friendly place because um, it's really important to connect these habitats that are the few that are remaining. Uh, it's important to connect them so amphibians can get, continue to get together with each other. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you.